God has not given us the spirit of fear, the spirit of fear but, of power, but of power, but of love, but of love and, a and a sound mind. I am not afraid. I am not afraid. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Little Axel is helping us there. We're going to talk about fear today and how fear can displace God at the center of your heart if you're not careful. I've entitled this sermon, Get Fear Out of Here. Now, I have fear. Some of them may be not as founded as others, but I hate snakes. Anybody out there hate snakes besides me? When I was a little guy, I was leaning back in a park and one crawled over my hand. I've been afraid of those dumb things ever since. They're just, uh, they're, well, the Bible calls the devil the serpent. So serpent, snake, they're bad. I'm just saying, biblically, you can see that, right? And I remember a few years ago when Karen and I were going for a walk and she said something casually and softly and I was talking and I didn't quite hear it and I walked on and she said it again and I was still talking and then all of a sudden I'm standing over a snake. I thought it was six feet long. She said it was two feet long but it reared up like this and I started trying to get back and I couldn't move. I barely could just stay jumping in place trying to keep it from striking somewhere and when I was done and got back, I noticed that she was laughing pretty hard. I said, man, that was terrible. Why didn't you tell me that it was there? And she said, I did, twice. How did you tell me? I said, snake, snake. I said, no, Karen, that's not how you do it. What you say is, snake, snake. And then I know to stay away from the serpent. I don't, she's one of those Pentecostal snake handers. She'll just pick it up, those little gardener snakes. Not really, but sort of. She's not afraid of snakes, I'll tell you that. I don't like them. People say that the fear of speaking is greater than any other fear, greater than the fear of snakes. I don't believe that. Who's walking in the desert and says, look out for that podium? Nobody. It's a snake. I hate those dumb things. And the Bible says that the devil is a serpent, and that snake wants us to be so afraid that we can't move forward. And I want to talk about that today. Fear. It's a tool in the hands of the enemies. I'm going to prepare you as a soldier of Christ to get ready for battle. Here's what you need to know. One of the big things is the devil wants to make you fear. He wants to make you fear the very worst thing happening. He's the enemy of your soul, and he wants to keep you from functioning well, and he will bind up your spirit with fear. And the Bible says, fear not. Fear's a great temptation for every one of us. It's a, it's a reality. We face it. And we can't get through life without facing it at some level. There are going to be experiences that come up where we'll be tempted to think the very worst. We'll have the fear that life is going to pass us by without someone loving us. That's a real fear. A fear that we will fail in these circumstances, in life, in this relationship, in this job. A fear of death, which is real and a reality. It's appointed for man wants to die. And if we're not careful, the enemy will work with us in such a way where we will fear to the point where we think that God has abandoned us, that he doesn't care about me, he doesn't care about my situation, this thing. Today's scripture is one of the most inspiring and uplifting in the Bible. Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 41.10 said this, and this is for all of us. I know it's written for a nation, but we can take it to our person too because it's real. And God says this to his people, do not fear. It's the words of God. For I am with you. Do not be afraid. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will also help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. You see, fear comes into our lives because we're thinking more of our power than his. We're thinking more about what we can do than what he has done and will do for us. And here's what he said. Now, we all have to take responsibility for this at some level. Do not fear. That's what he said. That's not what he wants for us. And we sort of know that as believers, but we still worry. And boy, do we have some things to worry about that are reality these days. Isn't it true? The pandemic. Finances have been affected. Our health has been affected. Loved ones have passed away. Relationships are affected because there's so much tension at home. The kids are at home all the time, and we worry. 
Now, I want to tell you something about worry. I'm going to tip you off. It's something that will help you as you go forward in the future. It's not talked about enough in the body of Christ. But Matthew 6, 27 says this. You cannot add any time to your life by worrying about it. So here's the word. Worry will never help you one little bit anywhere. It's not good for you. It will cause things to spiral out of control. It has no value add. None today, none tomorrow, none for the future. And God says, I don't want you there. I want you to trust in me. Stop thinking about your ability. Stop, start thinking about mine. Don't worry. It can't add anything to your life. There's no value add. So let's think about it this way. Worry. What if you worry from here to there and the worst thing you thought would happen didn't happen? 95% of the time, that's what happens. You worry about the worst and it doesn't happen. So now you've ruined your quality of life between here and there and it hurts the quality of life of people around you too. This is why God doesn't want it for you. The enemy wants it to spiral and cause all kinds of lack of faith among everybody in the home and around you. And so... It's usually not going to happen. That's why we don't want to worry. But let's look at the very worst can, say, case scenario in your situation. Maybe, let's say it happens. Is it helpful <clears throat> for you to worry from here to there and then it happens? I'm here to tell you that it'd be better for you and for your family and everybody around you, even if the worst happened, that from here to there, you weren't worrying. That it wouldn't affect everything around you and cause tension and dynamics. What if we just tried to make the best of this thing and trust in God no matter what and knowing that here, there, in the air, he has us. He has us. He loves you. It can't add anything to your life. So don't do it. There's these fears of, of all these things and God says, do not be afraid. Can we get that thing to move? Maybe not. Okay, so there's no value add. Anxiety is a normal human emotion, that's true, and yet God says, do not fear. Don't worry about the worst thing happening. Trust in me. Snakes again, let's talk about that. We're making a correlation today with the devil and the the serpent and the fear that he wants to bring. Another scenario happened in my life reality when I was seven or eight years old. I'm in Texas with my dad. We're hunting in an orchard. He has a shotgun. We're hunting rabbits. I know, but dad was the one shooting. I'm just saying. I'm just there as a little guy, right? And so he had my brother and I walk through brush piles or around certain areas to flush out the rabbits. And one day he said to me, walk around that big brush pile and see if we can get any rabbits to come out of there. Now, this brush pile wasn't normal. It was larger than a house, probably bigger at the base than a house. I think they were orchard trees that had been taken out and piled up. And so I started around, kind of shook the sticks a little bit. And I got around to the backside. Dad couldn't see from there. I couldn't see him. And I noticed that it went down into the water. This big mountain of brush went down into the water. And it was probably 30 feet that I had to cross on the sticks to get to land on the other side. But I thought, okay. Dad asked me to do it. I'm going to do it. So I got up on those sticks, and I was walking up, trying to stay above the water because everything kind of tended to go down. And then I got about in the middle, and all of a sudden, I must have hit a nest of snakes, water moccasins. I don't know if you know what that is, cottonmouth. Those things, if, if they strike at you and they, and they bite you, you're dead in two minutes. And all of a sudden, there's six or seven water moccasins all around me going down this brush, my right, my left, I see them teeming in the water, and I just, my, my heart came up into my throat. I couldn't move. I didn't know whether to go up or down or back or forward. And I finally decided, I'm, the forward is better. I'm going to get out of here, and I went as quick as I could to get out of there. But that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to bring something that's so fearful that you're paralyzed, and you can't move forward. You're paralyzed, And you can't even do what God's given you to do in this life as a ministry. The devil would love that. As long as you're not doing anything that's effective for him, he feels he can't take your soul, so he just wants to take your effectiveness. There's only two alternatives. Either go forward or give up moving forward. And the first one's not good. 
I mean, the first one's the best one. Go forward. Don't give up moving forward. Romans 16, 19 says it this way. I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Keep moving forward. Keep doing what you know to do. Keep being faithful to the Lord, trusting in the Lord, praying, staying connected to the vine, and God will crush the enemy underneath your feet. You see, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and kill is part of it, but the steal and destroy is about the now. It's about the now. What would be good that's going to happen tomorrow? He wants to steal that with worry. He wants to stop it from happening. Don't let him paralyze you because God says this. Next thing he says in Isaiah 41.10, I am with you. He goes on to say there, I am your God. You are never alone. Think of that. The all-powerful God of the universe knows your name. He knows how many hairs are on your head and evidently science tells us we lose a couple hundred a day. That's pretty good to keep count of how many hairs are on your head. He's intimately acquainted with you, and he loves you. You say, maybe, maybe he loves others more than me, Pastor Stan, because I'm not the greatest Christian. Well, let me ask you a question. You, do you have a toddler? Anybody have toddlers in the house? You probably had them. Uh, you know, you can find out about sin nature. Just get a couple little two-year-old boys and throw a toy they both want down in the middle of them, and let's see how it goes. And you'll find out that they can be rough and they can make mistakes and they can pout and they can hit and they can do all these things. And I just have a question for you, mom, dad, do you love them? You still love them? You love them with all your heart. They're learning, they're growing, they're becoming. And I just want you to know you're his child. He loves you. He knows your name. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going through and he is there for you. He is here for you right now. You're never alone. And that's the beauty of following Jesus. If everyone else forsakes you, you're still not alone. God is with you. God loves you. Sometimes we're pursuing the love of others, and it's one of the things that causes our greatest pain. Pursue God with all your heart. Let him be your main pursuit of love, and all these other things will fall into place. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you, the Bible says. The all-powerful God of the universe has complete and perfect love for you even though you make mistakes and he's here for you and he has all power in his hands to help you. But our feelings would say, and I've been there, listen, in case you think that uh, I've never worried, if I'm giving that impression, I have an inclination to be a worrier. This is a problem that I have had to overcome and have to overcome by the disciplines that I'm speaking today. And I'm here to tell you that what I'm telling you is better than the alternative. I've done both. I've worried and it didn't help. And then I've done what God's asked me to do and it, it went better. And so I'm speaking from experience as one humbly saying, I can't do it, but I, I believe he can. He's done it for me and I think he'll do it for you. And you'll come to a moment and you'll say this, but God, where are you? How could all of these bad things happen? How could this happen if you love me? I guess the premier thought there being if you follow God, you never have any struggles whatsoever. That's not true. The Bible never said that. Look at every great man and woman of God in the Bible and you will see major trials for every one of them. You see, God is the God that either will deliver you from the fire. You remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were thrown into the fire. They had done nothing wrong. Completely righteous dudes who were loving God, honoring God. I love the courage that one of them spoke with. They said, we know our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're going to serve him. That's what they told the king who was threatening them to take their lives. Even if he doesn't, I'm going to serve him. I want to carry that heart. I want to carry that warrior heart. So I don't care what happens. I'm going to trust you no matter what. Because I believe that doing that is better at the beginning, it's better in the middle, and it's better at the end with whatever we go through. I believe that it brings deliverance, that it brings healing, that it brings help, and even if he doesn't deliver me, I want to have faith before I see him. That's just the way I feel. Now, I've had friends who felt different, but that's the way I feel, that, and I, but I got to fight for it. I got to fight for that faith at times. God, where are you? What's interesting about this story, this famous scripture in Isaiah 41.10 was written in the day when they had Lamentations, the book of the Bible, as part of their reading. Lamentations, the word, the root word for Lamentations is lament, 
to cry, to moan, to groan, to be in a bad place. Nothing's working out. We're lamenting. And that whole book is pretty depressing if you read it at some level because they're, they're, God's not with them. It's not working out. They can't see him. Powerful forces had wounded Israel and that nation, and they were feeling crushed. And here's how they felt. Now, this is in the day of Isaiah when this scripture that we're talking about today was written. They had this as part of their reading, and this is the way the nation was feeling, Lamentation 5.20. Why do you continue to forget us? Why have you abandoned us for so long? They had moved to the place where they felt that they were abandoned. Now, Isaiah and the people in his day had that as their reading, and that's the way they were feeling, and it's the atmosphere where God speaks to the prophet and brings this scripture that says, no, 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 no. I am with you. In the midst of their doubt, he didn't condemn them. He said, I am with you. I love you. I'm for you. I'll give you strength. Hold on. I'll pull you through. And we see that happen in the nation of Israel. Even though you can't see him, even though it's been hard, he's there for you. He is with you and he will help you. But you got to put your hand in his. You got to choose to look to him and follow him and trust in him and not yourself. When my son Aaron was just a little guy, maybe 10 or 11 months old, we were traveling as a district youth director for the Assemblies of God. Now what that meant is we did 34 events a year where we trained youth pastors, did camps for kids. 10,000 kids went through all these events. We had 1,000 volunteers and we were on the road for 30,000 miles a year. We had a blue caravan and Aaron was born. We traveled together 90% of the time, Karen and I did. When Aaron came, it was 70%. When Candace came, it was 50%. It's hard to travel, you know, four to six to eight hours a day with little guys, right? But that's what we did. My kids are great travelers still today because, man, when they were babies, we were going hours in cars, and we'd stop along the way and give them a break, but that was our lives. And something unique happened. Candace hadn't come yet, <clears throat> but Aaron was just a little guy. And when it would get dark, we'd go on those long drives heading out somewhere to eastern Oregon, southern Oregon, a long trip, and darkness would set in. Those were the days <clears throat> that you could face your children's seat forward, and Aaron was in the middle seat right behind us. And when the darkness would come, we'd hear a little whimper. He started to be afraid because he couldn't see us. And then the darker it got, he would begin to cry every time. And when Aaron started to cry, I had an arm that was long enough to reach back and grab his hand. And every time I took his hand, he stopped crying almost immediately. It was as if he was saying this, okay, dad, I didn't know you're there. Okay, but I feel you now. You got my hand. We're good. I'm okay. My dad's here. I think God wants you to know that in life, that if you'll reach out in the dark, he'll take your hand. He'll give you strength and comfort and you'll have this feeling that it's not me who can make good things happen, but it's God, and I'm staying with him. We don't fear because we're confident that God is with us. You can be confident that he loves you, that God is with you, that God will help you, that God will watch over you. What is it that you're facing? Know that he's there for you. Know that he will help you. God loves you, and God is is for you. Give me the next slide, please. These are words of comfort that come right from the Father. If you're lost and you're in the dark, he's reaching out to take your hand. First Peter 5, 7 says this, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He says this, next thing, the third thing I want you to hear today as he says, I will strengthen you. That's what God says to you. I will strengthen you. Feel weak? I've been there. Feel like you can't go on? You're going through some hard times? God says, I will strengthen you. He says, I will help you. I'll uphold you with my hand. God is watching over us and he's watching out for us. God is watching over you and he's watching out for you. He knows what you're going through, whether it's an addiction. Someone might say, well, I led myself there and 
I only have myself to blame, and <clears throat> maybe I should just give up and take my own life. People get there sometimes because they can't overcome, but I want to tell you something if you have an addiction. God loves you. Every one of us who sit here, everyone under the sound of my voice has been forgiven of sin. None of us deserve the grace or the mercy of God. And no matter where you've been, perhaps you knew at one time the way to go and you fell back. God loves you. He never gives up his love for you. We know it from the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son went off and did his thing with prostitutes in a foreign land, took his inheritance, and he squandered it, the Bible says. But God was waiting on the front porch. That's who the father is in that story. It's God. And the moment that that boy was ready to come home, God embraced him. And God will embrace you, and God will give you strength to overcome your addiction and overcome your sin. He cares about you. He doesn't want you to walk in it anymore because it's wounded you. But he has strength and power beyond your power to help you overcome. Perhaps it's a traumatic event that you didn't bring it on yourself. You're facing, you're facing some tough things that were just spoken to you, even to the point of death. I mean, what can be tougher than facing that? But in the midst of David's struggle with these things, he says this in Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. There he is, overcoming fear in the midst of it, putting his trust in God. Now, here's what I think. These, these aren't just words that are spoken, and that makes it better. These are words that are spoken by faith, and when someone exercises faith to say, I will not fear, I'm going to trust in you, the Spirit of God comes in a strong way to abide and to help. Here's what the Bible says. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You have to have faith in him. I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then he comes and he picks you up. He won't violate your will. If, if I mean, for me, if I want to pout, he'll let me pout sometimes. I can pout and talk about how bad everything is and it never helps a bit. But the moment I turn to him is the moment he meets me. And see, we need faith for healing to flow. Worry is an atmosphere where faith cannot abide. Worry damages faith. Worry leads to doubt. And, and God says that, that faith is required for even healing. Now, I, I have not, it's not been my experience that God will heal everything, but I'm going to tell you something. He wants to heal a lot of things. And he says, you have not because you ask not. And if we can put our trust in him to say, I love you. I know you're a healer. I know you guide. I know you provide. I know you bring strength. Guess what happens? We get more of those things when we put our trust and our faith in him. But maybe you've been hit hard. And, and per, probably, I'm sure, some of you hit harder than I've been hit in my life. I don't want to diminish the reality and the difficulty of your struggle. What I want you to know is your God loves you and he's there for you. Your God is powerful and he can help you through and he can bring miracles into your life. Your God will give you heaven someday where there's no more pain, sorrow, or tears. And if you've been hit hard, consider this. Years ago, my daughter Candace was about five years old and we put her in that first year of soccer. And we found out the first game, she's pretty quick. She's got some skills. She scored a couple goals, and we thought, okay, we got a little athlete here. Everything's going fine until the third game. And then we played this team that had this girl woman on their team. I mean, all the girls are about 40 pounds, right? And then there's this one woman out there, man. I wanted to check her birth certificate. She looked like she weighed 100 pounds at five years old, and she could move well. And I thought, look at her go. Wow. It's a little scary, and they're flying around. Amazon woman's moving fast. Karen doesn't see her. She, Karen, or I'm sorry, not Karen. You're Karen. Candace doesn't see her. Comes flying in. Amazon woman doesn't see her. Hits her, and Candace got hit so hard, it looked like a violent car accident. I mean, this other lady went right through her. She flew back. Her head popped. She hit the ground, and she wasn't moving, so we're all out there. Wondering if she's got a concussion, trying to help her through. Had someone who knew something about um, medicine or medic and took a look at her and we got her to the sideline. She didn't play the rest of the game, but guess what? <clears throat> she got hit so hard the next game, she didn't want to play either. She didn't want to play anymore. She had a coach that was about 6'3 and 250 pounds. I'm sure he'd never played a day of soccer in his life. But he was a good dad who was out there to help those girls because the, the main thing is just have fun, girls, at five years old, right? 
And so that game came and I saw him, next game, I saw him kneel down and ask Candace something and she went like this. No, he was asking her if she wanted to go in. He asked her three or four times, she wouldn't go in. She'd been hit so hard that she didn't want to play anymore. Next game came, same thing. She wouldn't play. We tried talking to her carefully between games, but it's hard when you've been hit hard. And listen, some of you have been hit so hard, it's hard for you to get back in the game. You got knocked down. You didn't know it could hurt this bad. You didn't know that life could bring this kind of pain. And you're, you're just backing away and saying, I don't know. I don't want to play anymore. Well, let me tell you what happened. Second game, she didn't play. Third game, she didn't play. Fourth game, that coach knelt down and took her hand. And I saw Candace shake her head, yes. And all of a sudden, 250-pound coach is running out on the field with Candace, that 40-pound little blonde-haired girl. And he's running around with her. He's got her hand. And he's keeping her on the perimeter, not getting her too close in the action because she's been hurt pretty good before. But he's just kind of reacclimating her to let her know that it's safe and it's okay and she can still be a player. And he'd get close to the ball and she would shy away. And then one time the ball came loose and he brought her close and she kicked that thing. And a minute later I saw her shake her head and he let go. And she went on. And you know what? She became a great soccer player through the years. She led Horizon two years in a row right here in soccer in scoring. And she knocked down a lot more people than knocked her down from that point on. But man, I tell you, I love that coach. You know why? Because he came alongside my girl. And I want to tell you something about pain right now. No one at Horizon does pain alone. We are here for you. If we don't know, then we can't help. You might have to let us know. If you're going through something and we don't know, let us know. We're here to help. But now, brothers and sisters in Christ, let's be the ones that take the hand. Let's be the ones who've seen some people knocked down, who've seen some people who are going through a trial and comes alongside, takes their hand, and we're the hands and the feet of Christ. We're the voice of Christ as his word comes through us to strengthen. We bring scriptures that would help them through their day and through their time. And pretty soon, those that have been hit hard, because listen, yesterday it was me, today it's you, tomorrow's the person beside you. We're all going to get hit hard in this life. We need each other. Let's walk together. But, but God would send people. He's coming through people, and that's us. Jeremiah 32, 27 says this, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Listen to this. This is God speaking to you and your problem. Is there anything too hard for me? The implication is no, nothing's too hard for me. Hey, man, you're really fortunate. The all-powerful God of heaven knows you and loves you and is ready to work on your behalf. Can you believe that? Now, I'm going to give you the antidote to worry. I don't usually do this at the end of a sermon where I wrap it all up and give you a formula. But here it is in the, in the Word. Here's how you overcome worry and anxiety. Philippians 4, 6-7. This is the Word of God. And this is written in a paraphrased version called The Message, and it says this. This is right from God's heart. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. So here it is. Now I'm going to put this in A through E, how to overcome your fears. Here it is, right on the screen for you. A, don't worry. Take a little responsibility to say, okay, God, I'm going to give this to you. I'm not going to hold on to it. B, turn your worry into prayer. Listen, man, you don't think I've been there? I've been in, I've been in situations where we're $700,000 in our budget. And if we don't have a turnaround in a month, we're laying off 30 employees. That'll keep you awake all night because they're mouths to feed with people who love Jesus and they're doing great ministry. We have 200 employees between church school and daycare here at Horizon. And here's what I had to do. I had to follow this. Instead of laying awake and worrying all night, I got down. I mean, how long are you going to do that? Get out of bed. You're awake already. Get down on your knees and turn your worry into prayers. He doesn't say deny the circumstances. Here it is. See, let God know your concerns. Tell him what's going on. 
Tell him what you're feeling. Invite him into those circumstances. And then it's so important because D, this is right in the scripture we just read, he'll come and settle your heart down. I can't tell you how many times that's happened for me. Where I'm all anxious and I pray either in the middle of the night or some other situation, place during the day, I pull away, I tell him, I ask for his help, and he comes and settles me down. Now, here's, here's the thing about being settled down. I get up, the circumstances haven't changed. You see, God's big enough where he can give us peace even though the circumstances haven't changed. And it's a lot better to have peace than not. And then we have peace and we can think right and we can love right. And then it says he displaces worry with his presence. He displaces your worry with his presence. Here's what I have to say to that. Woo! That is awesome. Come on, man. Take his promise. He's just saying, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Put your hand in his in the midst of the darkness. Trust in him with all your heart. He will not fail you. You say, man, it's been a while. Keep trusting. It's the best way. At the start, at the middle, at the end. Trust him. He's trustworthy. He will not fail you. He loves you. I want you to bow your heads and we're going to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, come now. Come by the power of your Holy Spirit. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, I want to give you a chance to put your hand in his for the first time. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's me and that's you. The Bible says that God made a way through Jesus Christ so that our sins can be forgiven. He sent Jesus to walk on this earth, to show us who he is, to show us how he loves. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what God is like, shown through Jesus Christ, his son. But God said he sent his son into the world, John 3, 16, so that by his death, we could be raised to life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever will believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's life in this earth, the best life, and that's life in heaven. Life on this earth is not free of pain. Life in heaven is. And you get heaven. You get the best on earth and heaven when you come to him. Perhaps you're like me. You're a prodigal. You've made a lot of mistakes in your life. But I can tell you for a fact that God forgave me and he'll forgive you that God loves you, that God's not against you. He's for you, and he's reaching to you today. I want every head bowed and every eye closed, and I'm going to ask you to lift your hand in just a moment. If you want to pray to invite Jesus into your heart, what you're saying is, God, I'm going to give you the steering wheel of my life. I'm going to trust in you with all my heart. I I tried it on my own. I've got a hole in my heart, and I'm going to tell you the only way it can be filled is with Jesus. Peace, strength, help, eternal life. You lift your hand in just a moment if you want to pray a prayer to invite Jesus into your life. And here's the way it'll happen. Everybody in this room will say that prayer out loud loud with you, line by line, to give strength to your words, lend strength. God is here, and he'll hear you, and he'll come into your heart and life. The Bible says he knocks on the door of your heart, and if you open it, he'll come in. Are you ready to let Jesus come into your heart? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lift your hand on the count of three if you want Jesus to come into your heart. You're going to pray that prayer with all of us today. Lift your hand on the count of three. No one looking around, please. One, two, three. Just lift your hand up quick. You're saying, Pastor, I hear you today. I want to come to Jesus. Okay, God bless you and you. God bless you. Anyone else? All right, maybe you didn't lift your hand, but if you mean it in your heart, you pray it with us. People are coming to Jesus. Everybody say this out loud. Say, Father God, I'm a sinner and I've made a lot of mistakes but I believe that you love me. I believe that you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. Jesus, come into my heart and make me brand new. I'm gonna follow you with my life. Thank you for saving me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now one more thing, if you're going through a trial, and you need to put your trust in Jesus, I want you to lift your hand up. You're facing fear right in the face, and you need faith. I believe God gives a measure of faith. If you're going through a trial that's difficult right now, 
No one looking around. I just want you to slip your hand up and say, I'm going through a hard time right now, man. I need God to displace worry at the center of my life with, with his love and his presence, okay? All right, there's a number of hands. Everybody stand. Would you stand to your feet? Pray for your brothers. Pray for your sisters right now. Like I said earlier, yesterday me, today them, tomorrow you. We need to be there for one another. We're praying. You reach out to the Lord and you pray. Father God, we come to you bringing all of our fears. Lord, the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. God, you said worry can't add anything to our life. It's, there's no value add, and, and yet in our humanness, we find ourselves worrying. I pray for strength for my brother, strength for my sister right now. In Jesus' name, I pray that your presence would displace the worry. They're reaching, they're trusting God. They're reaching to heaven saying, Lord, meet me, give me strength. I pray for your peace and your comfort and your strength to come in Jesus' name. In the Old Testament, there was a form of praise where they clapped their hands and the thought was that the sound drove the enemy out of the camp. And I believe that the enemy wants us to have the worst thoughts. We're going to drive him out of the camp by praising God with a standing ovation. Can we do that right now? Hallelujah. We're going to trust in you, Jesus. Hallelujah.